crafted me with my Lego, and my sister's trying to steal it. So this is like a lifelong passion. <laughs> Um, finally, also a public service announcement. I'll be at South by Southwest and we'll do a, uh, what's called a Mindstorms Hackathon uh, with Google on Rainy Street on the 11th. And that's basically a place where you get to work with the Mindstorms products, try to do different things with it, work it, tweak it, and also do a race with, uh, with these Mindstorms robots that you're going to create. So that's just a public service announcement. Without further ado, sorry, um, I have like, I want to talk about these three overall subjects because that's kind of what defines what kind of how the state of the nation is for the labor community. Just for, so everyone knows here that I work with what we call the labor community, which is mainly 13 plus Lego fans who love Lego for what Lego is. These guys have a tremendous impact across the world, and I'll cover this in uh, this presentation. First thing, the unstoppable passion. The first thing is you know, when you work with social and digital media, this is the usual model that you end up having. You have uh, all these small people, they're discussing, and then you come and then you see the conversation into the mist, and then they start talking about what you want them to talk about. That was what I did. When I started at Lego two and a half years ago, this was how I viewed the world. And uh, after a couple of months, this happened. We got a letter, this is here, from a French Facebook community that was called It Hurts Like Blank When I Step on Lego Bricks. And uh, basically, it says in French, I'm not going to translate all of it. Um, Dear Lego, I'm in this Facebook community, we're 347,000 people strong. Uh, it's called It Hurts Like a Blank When You Step on Lego. You've caused us all this pain for all these years, and we would like an apology. <laughs> so I thought, now I have the perfect chance of showing how I can kind of come with my own thing into the mix here and show everybody and you know, be the new social hero. So the thing we did, we did a very, very brief sort of uh, short video where we said that, sorry about all this, and, but we will this year put out another 32 billion Lego bricks that will crowd your floors, and we have a solution where you can walk around the space place on it. And I thought, this is the greatest thing ever done. Um, it's going to take off. And I sat Friday at home, got, had a glass of wine, and I looked at the Twitter feed, and it was going crazy. But the challenge was, it was not my idea, it was something else. It was this. It was a Lego printer that I'm hooked up with some Mindstorm gear, some technique. He made a printer that could kind of print anything with Lego from a computer. And that was what everybody was talking about. I got like 60,000 views on my platforms. This guy, he got 2.2, uh, sorry, there we are, 2.2 million views in a matter of a couple of weeks. <coughs> he totally blew the, all of my, my plans to become this new social media hero for Lego. And it also spilled over like Wired and all sorts of so that taught us a very, very important lesson. You know, it's actually more interesting what the users talk about around your product than what you can talk about yourself. So, is, uh, I don't, is Anna here yet? Or hasn't she come yet? Sorry about that. Um, I had a talk with uh, a scholar from NYU uh, last week. It's called Anna Akbari. And I think it was interesting. She said, well, it's great you work at Lego and so on. And I was in this office space with a lot of guys, and they actually have the Lego 2 here. And I thought, oh my goodness, she has one of these. And Anna, of course, didn't know what it was, but this is the Hugman project done uh, with these small men being placed at all these different locations on Manhattan. And it's done by this guy, who's a New York native. He's called Nathan Suea. He's a Lego artist, and he exhibits uh, around the world. He currently has an exhibition running in Australia. And the idea with these Hugmen that Anna actually, uh, I don't know if she, she uh, lended it or borrowed it, is about going out into a public space and putting these hug men around there and, and watching what people do and how they interact with them. And you can see people, this woman is taking pictures of them. A lot of other people, they, they kind of just looked at them, pointed at them, interacted with them. And of course, some people, they got them brought them home, and that was also the point. This is kind of an art project that goes into urban space, but also then back into people's homes. But the thing that's interesting with, with Nathan, and now I bring up Nathan because he's, uh, he lives here in New York City on Manhattan, in fact. He's, he used to be a Wall Street lawyer, but now he's a full-time Lego uh, artist. He does art, he does um, things for people that you know, want to make 3D models of stuff in Lego. He's been, he has his own Jeopardy category. So this is kind of a social reach some of these people that use the creative medium has. And it's quite impressive. I think this is probably the most famous thing that's been, this has been covered and copied a lot of times. The uh, artist uses it as a cover of uh, an album, so on. So he has a significant 
Also, just to show you a bit more about all this stuff and action, some of these ideas is just three quick cases from the last couple of months. Uh, this happened from uh, Big Bang Theory. Uh, this guy wanted to be an astronaut. He uh, kind of ended up not being it. And he turns back to the Lego and kind of were doing the terrible, terrible thing that happened to all Lego games. When they get uh, around 12 or 13 years old, they've been building with bricks since they were kids. But then they've discovered the two main uh, antagonists in terms of Lego. It's women and it's beer. And that's what usually happens. And that's what people go into what, what our fans call the dark ages. So that's why you don't build the bricks anymore. So uh, the Simpsons, they have this new uh, clone brand. Uh, it looks like our logo, but, but Homer looks scared, so that's good. And also, just to show you uh, an answer back from the Lego group to our community, this is kind of a, a big biker, which is uh, one of our new Asian complex sets. And we've, in fact, put a uh, logo of a deceased fan on the thing to kind of, it's a way of innuendo communicating with our community. And of course, kids, they, they just think it's a cool logo, but it's actually the, the, the call name of the Lego community and the logo that we put on Spaceship. So that's kind of how we also communicate with them in a, in a very subtle manner. So let's talk about a bit about connection. The first thing, you know, one of the, thing, the key things that, that came out of all this mind storms and mind storms hacking that happened back in the first year, uh, late 90s and then in the 2000s was we have an internal discussion. You know, we own the trademark, but do we really own the brand? Because the thing that, this is the thing that I usually say, and it's a big discussion, you know, we can control the trademark, but if you take the Lego logo and put it on your own box, we, we will unleash the hounds and the lawyers will chase you down and bite you. But, you know, if you just love this for what it is, you know, then it's kind of, it, it's, we don't own that. So we see it like there's interrelation with the Lego group. Basically, by the way, I'm, legal, I'm not allowed to call it this, but this is what the fans call the Lego group. The least. But there's an interrelation around the brand with the Lego group and the users, but also a lot of things happen here between the users sense making of how the label brand is perceived. So we kind of say if, if the brand is not the mind of the consumer, it's not really anywhere and it doesn't have any value. This is highly valuable and it's kind of a game changer in a lot of ways for, for working with the brand and looking at the brand. And of course, you know, as, as you all who have studied communities, especially the Carla Davidson community, when you get people getting tattoos, then things are pretty serious. <laughs> so also the, the, the next thing is we can't control the passion. People do like for all sorts of things that are not in line with our brand values. You know, they do Occupy Legoland. They've made a mock set of the city looters of London. They do things like Second World War things and guns and so on that are totally out of bounds of the Lego. And this is great because the fans actually have their own domain in which they can work with the bricks and do great things. So that's very, very exciting and exciting to observe. Of course, we can't endorse it as such, but we still look at it. All right, just to show you also the, real, the way this, a very strong community can, can um, affect your brand and your PR. I know, probably, is there anybody from brands who tried that, you know, journalists, like you already said, that really can't, they, they don't use capital letters, they call your, your brand something wrong. You know, when these things happen, this is a thing I think is from, uh, it's from Gizmodo. This is one of our new things that was called Life of George that was shown. The thing that's interesting about Life of George is it's a great thing, an interactive thing where you build things and take pictures of it. Kids love it and parents love it too. But the interesting thing in this case is, you know, the guy calls, he uses some word called Legos, L-E-G-O-S. And the, well, we in the group, we don't really know what that means. But he, he talks about Lego and then he mentioned this word. And then within a couple of minutes, you know, the fans, they rush to the rescue. You have like fans saying, I really hate how Americans can call multiple Lego blocks Legos. You know, I just thought I wanted to correct the idiot that blah, 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 blah. Fans are taking this or branding seriously. Maybe I would like, you know, a bit more, you know, friendly tone when this, this is happening. Of course, you know, it's very difficult because if other people answer back with their fond childhood memories. Like, you know, I, even though I thought that uh, you're probably right, I'm still going to call it Legos. And it's like Legos, 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 Legos. Legos. <laughs> But these guys, the fans, they don't give up as easy because, you know, it's hard to argue when people end up quoting Saxon grammar and all sorts of rules on why it's called Lego bricks and not Legos. So this is some of the things that, you know, that are really funny. We even have examples where they kind of chase certain uh, blogger journalists around on their blogs saying every time they make a spelling error or something, they, they don't think it's right. Of course, this is not something we endorse, but it's still very funny. 
So the really key thing for us in, in working with the fans, you know, a lot of you guys probably are community managers working with them in a digital context, but go out and meet the fans. That is our kind of killer application for this. This is um, pictures of most of our senior manager management, including the owner of Lego and our CEO, that on a regular basis, many times a year, go out and meet fans, discuss with the fans, have conversations with them, meet them in person. Because that's kind of a way of, of like taking that veil away you have when you are in the company. So I'm just going to tell you a small story just to show how close we are. You know, I had some, uh, some Lego fans who incidentally also work in the plastic industry, one of them he owns a plastic factory. He came to Bill in Denmark, our head office where I'm at, and had a discussion with me on a lot of fan issues and all sorts of stuff. And then um, the fans have a thing where they usually go around stalking around Bill at night and looking at all the facilities because sometimes you can actually see a new product or something, and that's always exciting. I have, of course, asked these guys, did you go, go around all our facilities to see if you can see something? He said, yeah, we did, but we didn't see anything, but we, we saw your CEO's office. I said, well, duh, you know, it looks like my office. There's a lot of Lego, and he has a bit more kids drawings than I have. And, and I said, how can you be trying to pick that out? Well, that was very easy, because when they met uh, four years prior, they gave him a small kind of thing they designed, and that was on a shelf in the office, and of course, with his office. And I went there the next day, and yes, it was on the office. Uh, so we have a very, very strong relation with, with people in the community on, on these kind of things. Just to, to give you a bit of theory on how we, we look at our community, we have um, a way of looking at it that's called consumer affinity curve. It's a tool being developed, has been developed since you know, three, four years ago, and we constantly try to develop it. It's the further you get up, the more affinity you have for Lego. You know, when you start down in that's a covered household, so that's probably most of you. You have some bricks somewhere in your house, maybe under the bed. Then you go up to active households, you bought something within the last 12 months, and then further and further up into loyalty programs and so on. And when you get to the top, that is when you are the users and user partners. These are the people who create tremendous, amazing amount of bricks. So the challenge is, when, when people get up here, how do you work with them? And that's some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. So this is kind of the way we, we kind of point in a new consumer-centric way, but that's what I like to call it. When we work with the top of the pyramid, these guys are, they spend a lot of money on bricks, they are very engaging and so on, what can you do with them? So it's all about closing the feedback. We build some bricks, it goes into a community model, you know, hundreds of blogs, thousands of websites, and then they create something like this. You know, this is actually built totally out of Lego. These amazing things that are mind-blowing. So the thing we want to do is we want to close this loop back to the company so, so we can give it even more interesting stuff to do. And one of the ways we do it is we have what's called the Lego Ambassador Program. It means that uh, we have currently 70 ambassadors all across the world. Each ambassador represents a group of Lego fans that are organized, and the ambassadors has a direct link into the company so they can kind of discuss with me and with a lot of my colleagues. But this means that are actually capable of, through an influence network, influence, we influence a few, we can influence the many. Because the challenge is, you know, if, if you're, let's say, Robert Gamble, and you have, uh, I don't know, a billion consumers, how can you have a, a meaningful conversation and a meaningful relation? Well, basically, it's difficult. What you can do, if you influence the right people, they can help you move influence down the affinity curve, so, so to speak. The best practices for working with these, if there's like one slide you should remember, take a picture of this one, because this is some very, very basic rules. Some of them are a bit overlapping, but it's about setting expectations, being reliable. This is kind of basically the same thing you should do if you have a friend and, or a family member. It's basic common sense. It's easy to say, extremely hard to do. I think probably one of the things that are uh, the most controversial and it needs, are the two bottom ones. Limit secrecy. Because you know, if you end up like working with product development for us and work with us in this appropriation process. It does not give you, it gives you a lot of value because it's fun, you get to see the company from the inside, but it doesn't give you any value when you go home if you can't tell what you've done and you're like covered in NDAs and non disclosure release forms and so on. It's kind of like James Bond would have a hard time picking up girls and he couldn't tell people he's a secret agent. It's the same thing. So try to live a secrecy and also a fair compensation. That's difficult because when you start compensating people with money, it's very, very hard to uh, have that what's called intrinsic motivation. That's motivation that's, that and pure passion. So if you start paying people for having their passion, you create
crowd out all the, the real excitement and the things they do on their own. So that's important. But if it turns into work, of course you need to take it into work. So the first thing, or the first of the cases we do is this one. This is the Lego Cruiser. It's our crowdsourcing platform. This basically means that if you have an idea and you can submit it here, if you gather 10,000 votes, we'll review it for production, and if it makes sense, then we'll put it in production. That's very exciting. We've been working on this since somewhere in the 90s with a Japanese company called Elf Design, who are great friends with us. So these are the three products that we put out now, uh, up until now. This here is sold out. It's the uh, Chinkai 6500, a deep water exploration vessel from Japan. That's also a cruise oil that's been developed in Japan. And we've predominantly been working in Japan for a long, long time, since we re until we relaunched it you know, on a more you know, uh, Anglo-Saxon, European, Western European platform um, this October. We did the Hayabusa, which is a uh, space exploration vessel. And then we have the big one that's coming up in the summer, the Lego Minecraft, which is currently open for pre-order pre online. And it's going to be sold out so fast, I can guarantee it. But the thing that's really, really interesting here is I think I, I talked with Eric and a couple of guys out before. You know, if I took all of you and I got all the best LEGO designers and our top management and all the social media gurus in, in a room and we did kind of a vote and worked on it, we would not come up with any of these three ideas. And the reason for that is, is basically it doesn't make sense. The first one is it's like a cuddle the whale with an orange hat from Japan. <laughs> does that make sense? No, it doesn't. But I think each of these does in their own way, they tap into a certain community somewhere online. And you know, when so you when you combine the Lego passion with another community that has a lot of passion, then great things happen. I'll just gonna show you a thing. When we started with the Shinkai, it took 420 days for it to reach the number of votes it should have. The Hayabusa was a bit more, you know, this guy with the Shinkai, he ran around to like fairs and passed out a few kind of leaflets and all sorts of stuff to reach this. The Hayabusa did it over seven days. Anyone who could kind of uh, have an idea of how long it took the Minecraft to reach the number of votes that you have? One day. Uh, a little later. Uh, <laughs> two days. 48 hours. You know, they just need to, people need to get up. When, we, when uh, Notch, who was the guy who founded Minecraft, or the Mojang company, started it off, they just needed a bit of time to pick up. But about 48 hours was, uh, was the time we did need it to, to hit the 10,000 votes. Because basically, guys, we had to change it when we went more global. Thousand votes to ten thousand votes, or else we'd have to do a lot of things for uh, um, review all the time. So, let's talk about the social objects and what our fans are talking about. I think this is also some great stuff. First of all, this is kind of the bragging slide. You know, it, it shows you that you know, we have almost nine hundred thousand videos on YouTube, um, one point two million pictures on Flickr. Um, the thing that's really interesting is when you look at Flickr and you know, where it's different from a lot of other. 1.2 million pictures is a lot on Flickr. The main repository of the Lego community is uh, called Brickshell, and it has about almost 4 million unique Lego pictures. So that's that's kind of interesting. But these guys are extremely passionate. And also, if you go up to uh, and search for the word Lego, at least a couple of months back, structure uh, all the videos that are about Lego after uh, the reviews, you have to go to page 19 to find something that doesn't have plus books. And a lot of these, almost none of them are sponsored or bought by Lego. It's a fan discussion. So, uh, let's take a look at, at one of the social objects. Could we uh, roll the video here? I just think you, you need a bit of comic relief. This is one of my favorites. Sorry for laughing at my own joke when this goes on, even though I didn't do it. It's basically, uh, it's called Death Star Cantina. It's a uh, stop motion movie done on an Eddie Izzard sketch. It's amazingly funny. It's even more funny than Eddie Izzard himself, or that says kind of a thing. So this is fun. But the interesting thing that happened with this um, late last year was, you know, currently the fans are crossing over into the mainstream. This social object that's done by a Lego fan is now on the Blu-ray extended uh, edition as extra material. So that's that's kind of fun. So the fans are crossing over into the mainstream. Even even I think it's the Engadget article here that kind of, you know, it talks a bit about Star Wars and then there's like two paragraphs of 
wow, this is so funny, this video, and I had such a laugh while watching. So, it might be also that it's the mainstream that's crossing over to the fans. You know, I, I think all this geek culture and, and all, I think how many people here go think of themselves as a geek? Yes, well, there's a few here, I mean, good. But, you know, these are some of the people that within the last 18 months have been out there spoken that they do something to play with. My favorite is probably David Beckham that on a TV show that was transplanted, uh, transmitted to 90 million people through some Cisco thing. He ends up like getting asked the question, what do you want to do if you want to play football? And he talks about Lego, and Cat Feely, who's interviewed, trying to just all the way push him over his architecture stuff, and he just talks about Lego and what set he bought. And the set he bought, of course, rose like 700 uh, percent in sales the day after. So, and even, you know, we had the president here is on doing some, uh, or meeting the, the Lego uh, Earth Level League champions in, in the White House, actually. So that was a lot of that. But you know, all this excitement, we thought a lot about how can we work with this, and maybe we should try and give something back. But it's always very, very difficult when you're a big company, a colossus with all sorts of guidelines and legal things, constraints, and business objectives, to try and work with fans who just have pure passion for what they do, and they move very, very fast. So what are we going to do about it? Let's take a look at the relevance in the next step. The thing that, that, that I wanted to do when I joined Lego was trying to not to connect some of all these lost Lego souls out there. Try to, to create this snowball of inspiration that would just continue downhill and roll over anybody so everybody would just wake up in the morning and say, well, what am I going to do today? Lego. So the idea was we talk, took the top of the pyramid and we tried to work with these people and leverage what they do towards the broader masses and celebrate these people, give them a platform of where they can like amplify what they do. So we don't talk about community management, we talk about community amplification. Let's see, I think this is interesting because this will just show you a bit of the new initiative. Could we roll this video please? This break has completely changed my life. Lego break started life as a toy, but it has become so much more than that. Today it's a medium for creativity with fans of all ages, backgrounds, and interests, all expressing a passion for the Lego break and the game. Wouldn't it be great if we could all come together, sharing our dreams and ideas? I'm just going to do like a sort of, sorry, the sound was a bit bad, but uh, it's online so you can actually see it. The project is called Rebreak. It's basically creating a social uh, media hub where you can share and distribute Lego related content. It's not an up uploading platform like you would see on Flickr, but it's all about moving the things from different places. It's about gathering great Lego content from, let's say, Flickr, Mark Bates, YouTube, and then pushing it out through social media. Channels to hit the lower part of our affinity pyramid, the people with latent Lego affinity. And that's something we've done. And, you know, we, we're still in a beta. We launched it, uh, or launched the open beta in December last year, and it's taking quite off a bit. But it's it's um, it's just exciting. There's so much content there, and the fans have really loved it. So just to sum it up, just to make sure I don't go over time, the idea here with the Rebrick project is, is basically the ideas and apples. About exchanging of ideas. If it's two apples you exchange, you both end up with one apple. But if it's ideas, every time you exchange, you end up with two ideas. And that's kind of the, the basic thing we do with this project and the things we do with our community. And uh, just this is the final slide, and I'll be happy to take a couple of questions and so on. And uh, with the mortal words of William Shatner on um, the model that's created for him. Any questions? Yep, here. You talked about your master program. You talked about your master program. How do you identify who the right people to connect you to the broader audiences? That's a very, very good question. The way we do it is, you know, when a fan group has had a certain life, when they have, have been organized, and when they've taken contact to the Lego group, then they get to appoint their own ambassador. Because if we go out and like cherry pick and say, this person should be the ambassador, then we crowd a lot of people out. So they have to figure them out themselves. 
And that is not, sometimes, you know, fan groups get split in two, and everybody say, well, oh, this is a bad fan group, and this is a good fan group, and so on. But we, they have to do this, this themselves. We don't kind of want to be the head of the schoolyard telling people what they can do and what they can't do. So that's a very, very good, uh, very good question. So that's how we do it. We let the fans do it themselves. Yep, down there. So, uh, how about talking about the um, so you've got a lot of great publicity out there. How about some of the, uh, the negative discussion that goes on, or the, or the, or the more mixed discussion? Uh, the thing that I'm specifically thinking about is the recent release of some of the Lego for Girls. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, well, it's, it's strange that you say Lego for Girls, because I think all Lego is for girls, as well as for boys. But the challenge has been, you know, when the girls were not buying it, we, tr we try to be innovative and do new things. And I know there's, there's been a whole bunch of things Lego should do this, and bring back beautiful, and so on. But, but you know, remember, we're not discontinuing other lines. This is, this is just a, a way of trying to get the girls into the hobby. And I mean, this is kind of totally my own thing. If, if that gets the girls to build Mindstorms, A-OK. -okay. And remember, the last couple of years, the first Lego League has been won, won by all girls' teams. So girls can build Lego. I hope that answers the question in kind of a very media-trained kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with your answer. My question is more: How do you, how do you, as a company, deal with the internally deal with that kind of chatter because it's clearly going on? Well, first of all, you know, every, as all other companies, you know, it's always you get a bit surprised when people say something. Why do you do this? And why is it good? And so on. And but but you know, we as a company, we embrace it and we also listen to the negative conversations. A thing that that's just analog to what you're saying. Our fans, when I go and discuss with. Like if I did sit in a room with fans, uh, only fans, they would be very, very critical. We, they would say, this set's not that good, how come you're doing this? The building experience is not as good as you did, did with this and this. As soon as one of you guys come in, the whole thing changes. And they'll say, well, oh, everything is nice and dandy. So I, I think it's for us to go and listen and also, you know, look at what we could do different. There, and there might be some things that, that we could do in our communication and understanding. But you know, it's, it's very difficult, you know, when you have this big need, social media thing that is going on and everybody is saying this and petitions here and petitions there. It, you, need to, you need to be respectful because it, it's not that they, that they haven't got a point. We just need to, to kind of, they're also a business. And, and, um, and that's also, you know, the most unethical thing a company can do is go out of business. So we need to make sure that, that these people are in line. But I can't come directly on it. Sorry about that. Other questions? Thanks a bunch. Sorry, I'm going to stop.